Okay, I've made you the host now. You can share the screen. Perfect. Okay. Can you guys see the screen? Can you guys see it? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thanks. All right. So uh, thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you guys for organizing this whole thing. It is supposed to be a very casual session. So in case you have any questions, please throw in, in the chat and I'll be more than happy to, uh, you know, go over, to go over your questions and, and answer them. So today's talk is going to be about my journey in the tech world and how I started right from uh, right from when I graduated from university all the way to, you know, the status quo. So uh, there's a lot to cover. It's going to be short and sweet, but in case you have anything that you want to say, please go ahead. It's going to be a, an open forum. The whole reason we're doing this is that we want to, you know, we want to get you to uh, really benefit and, you know, gain experience from other people's experiences. Okay, cool. So, uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, so, sorry. Uh, could you make me the host again? There's some people in the waiting room. No worries. All right, so I am making you the host. Yes. Okay, you are now the host. Okay, thank you so much. My pleasure. Okay, so for the people who, you know, who uh, are seeing for the first time, my name is Amina Tsadjer. I am a computer science graduate. I graduated from University of Bahrain for probably probably now I would say more than 12 years ago. So a lot, you know, that have, uh, a lot has just passed from the second I graduated till now. Uh, you can access my website at aminatajer.com or you can always contact me on Instagram or Twitter at aminatajer. I'm always very, you know, um, very reachable to be quite honest. And you can always ask me whenever you have anything in mind. Although I'm super happy to help whenever I get the chance. Um, so a bit of my myself, uh, I graduated as a computer science student, as I said, 12 years ago, back on, uh, give or take, I, uh, I worked in, in the US for a while in California, and I also worked in Saudi Aramco in Saudi for a while. And my job was, uh, my job actually revolved around uh, simulation and R&D, research and development. So that was extremely exciting for myself. I also do a lot of game development programming games, which is actually the, uh, the thing that got me to work in simulation to begin with in the US. Um, so yeah, and after a while, I started my business, which is Infinite Wear. And you're going to probably see now the, uh, <laughs> the, the history to, that, to making that happen. So yeah, let's just join it. OK, so when I started uh, back in the day, back in university, the two things that I really admired the most were software and games. And I really loved software and I really loved games, but I always had a problem figuring out how to really make it happen for both of them as a career. You know, like I really loved games, but I was pretty sure that, you know, it is almost impossible, at least in Bahrain or, you know, the surrounding countries to make a business out of it. You know, given that the Middle East has a lot of challenges, especially when it comes to understanding intellectual property and such and software and video games as well. But I always had those in mind when I started. So I wanted to build something that revolves around that. So uh, I remember, you know, I got myself really up to speed with software. And, uh, you know, I got myself up to speed with things like operating systems in Linux, um, things like programming on the PlayStation 3. And I, I still remember the first time I got my hands on, on, you know, the PlayStation 3 back in the day, or I think around 2006 or 2007, where I got to really, you know, try some of those software development uh, cool items and cool tasks on PS PS3. So that was really, really cool. But I was thinking to myself, okay, now enough with experimentation. Is that good enough? Should I go now for a career that spans software and game development or it's not really that feasible? So what has happened is I said, you know what, let me just experiment and do a bit of reconnaissance. Let me see if there's, you know, anybody that has any game development experience as a professional, let's say, uh, as a professional in the Middle East, or at least I'm behind. And when I did my research, I figured out that there's no, you know, game development, uh, let's say, uh, experience in making that as a commercial business in behind. So at that moment, I had this, you know, sparking life saying, 
hey, maybe it's time that I start something new within that space. And, you know, I get to explore how that is going to be financially be uh, financially suitable for myself. And if that's going to be, you know, interesting to do uh, along the line. And the thing is, I wanted to have this sort of cross section, you know, I wanted to be in this cross section in the middle of doing what I love and also doing something that I can consider as a career. So, you know, I can be financially independent as well. So that was the ultimate plan in the very beginning. And so long story short, I started by creating a company called Engine Technologies. And if you're coming from the game development scene, you would know that the word engine is really sacred in the game development space. So a lot of people talk about the game engines and engines like that. And so back in the day, I created Engine Technologies, which, is, which was a company that was extremely focused on building technologies for games. Uh, and a bit of, let's say, games in the beginning for you know, clients and customers. But it soon changed and shifted to building just business games, let's say, or B2B. Instead of doing it as a B2C business, we started doing this as a B2B business. As we figured out that that was actually the best course of action, uh, more people had, uh, let's say that we were more focused when we've done it as a B2B business. You know, we get to work with clients and large companies, and then we can persuade them into getting their own games as a marketing tool instead of just doing it for fun. So we normally, when you target clients and you target target customers, uh, sorry, beneficiaries or regular customers, you have to cater to all of those. And sometimes it might be very difficult to really get them to agree on the sort of content you do or you know, to keep that sort of channel with them. But having that business as a B2B business was, you know, the let's say, the most seen choice back then to do. And after five years, we figured out that, you know what, game development might not really take off as a business here on behind. So we might as well shift or pivot, as they like to say, into a more, uh, let's say, technical sort of business. And that would be, you know, doing artificial intelligence and machine learning for the people who are interested. So with Infiniteware now, after we pivoted five years, you know, after the inception of engine technologies, now we're called Infiniteware. And we are strictly an AI business. In fact, we are the first ones in Bahrain and probably the only ones in Bahrain up till date. And we live by those three values. The first one is, since I got the chance to work in multiple banks in Bahrain, and I have more than 10 years or probably 12 years, 12 years working experience in, in banks, I figured out that what, what a lot of people call work is not really actually work, it's just repetitive work that people like to sugarcoat it as creative and really important in key work. And so the number one goal that I had when I started this business was to automate mundane and repetitive work, which you will find definitely in corporate environments. And the second thing is I wanted to just get more space, let's say more intellectual bandwidth allocated for human beings to really focus on what really matters most to them. And so when you take those repetitive jobs, those repetitive tasks, you as a human being, you begin to see you know, what really matters to you and you get to focus on it. So that was the second goal to, you know, to get that sort of sense of uh, cognitive capacity back and give it back to the, to the to, to regular humans. And the last one, or last but not least, we wanted to add that intelligence sort of element in, in businesses and even client uh, and individuals. So instead of just, you know, uh, doing that sort of repetitive work and taking it off your dish and giving it to the machine using machine learning tools and such, we figured out that we wanted to add tools that can really bring the best of intelligence to make value for yourself, whether you're a commercial entity or whether you're an individual. So that was the ultimate goal. And I'm very happy to say that, you know, after starting the journey, you know, 12 years maybe in the making now, we have those set of clients now, which is, you know, a list that I'm really proud of, you know, with my team. So people that you can see, notably Saudi Aramco, where I used to work. STC and Zane, the Ministry of Interior, and a couple of banks here on behind. So exciting times. Okay, so the million dollar question is now, when you graduate from university, what should you exactly do? Should you follow your dreams, let's say, and work on your business and get things up and running on your own? Or should you really join a business or an existing company where everything is already laid out for yourself, you know, and you can probably just work and you know, get an income of some sort and you can just call it today. So what would you exactly do? And to me personally, that was the million dollar question. And a lot of, a lot of people have their own thoughts when it comes to navigating the world, you know, uh, the career world to say. But in my humble opinion, there are 
several ways, you know, uh, where you can go about this. The first one is you can either join a company and if you're lucky, you're going to join a really good company, a company that is not toxic a company that really understands the individual and understands your goals and, and it makes, uh, and it tries to make uh, sure, uh, it tries to make sure that your goals in life and your agenda, you know, as uh, let's say as an individual can really align with their uh, agenda as a business and somehow you can meet in the middle. But honestly, in Bahrain or even in the rest of the country, uh, in the rest of the Middle East world, at least, or at least even in the world, to be quite honest, that is a very difficult thing to, to fetch. I mean, you're going to be extremely fortunate if you can find a company that respects your agenda in life and caters to that. And so the second choice is that you can either, you probably, you know, you can start your own thing and make the most of it. It, must, it will definitely not be that easy, but you get to at least have a lot of perks that you wouldn't get if you join an, an existing company. One thing as a star, uh, which is having the full freedom to explore the, you know, the lines of work that you want to follow. So if you join a company, there's a huge chance that you're going to work on things that you don't like. So if, if we look at the at work disciplines, at least in Bahrain or any country that is surrounding us, you know, you have a limited amount of jobs that fit in you know, within certain disciplines. And so if you work, let's say, in a very eccentric uh, discipline, a very picky discipline, and then you try to add some of those skill sets and you, know, you want to bring them to the workplace, there's a huge chance that you're not going to work exactly as you study. And so you're going to have to somehow be flexible and do things that you might not necessarily enjoy. And so that is the first thing. You know, when you have a business, you get to work on what you want. You know, whenever you want, you get to be extremely selective about your customers. And this is something that I really enjoy, you know, being as a, being a, an entrepreneur. And I think the word entrepreneur is extremely abused, by the way. But, you know, the, the ability to go ahead and really do whatever you want is invaluable. It's, it's crazy. You know, you don't get to have that, especially if you are, let's say, years on, the, on your journey and your career. When you have more baggage, you know, you have more stuff on your head, things that you cannot, um, let's say, sacrifice when you have a lot of commitments, you get to that stage where you say, you know what, maybe the train has already left and I don't have much of a choice, to be honest. And so starting really early with that mindset is extremely important. And I wish that a lot of people understand, uh, understood that thought before going into their journey in their career. So when you graduate from university, you might not have a partner, you might not have a spouse at that moment, you might not have kids, you might not have financial commitments. So it is ultimately the sweetest spot, to be quite honest, to figure out if you want to go to route A or to go to route B. And not a lot of people get to have that chance back after you know they go into the uh, basically the road of having a job. So I'm not saying there is one better than the other. I'm just saying you get to actually choose at that moment. Everyone is different and everyone has different ways of looking at life, especially when we're talking about the journey of career. And so think about it really well, because your choices will really impact your psyche, your happiness, and your financial freedom. But I can talk, look, year, I can talk for hours, honestly, about that certain choice. In my humble opinion, the way I've done is that I wanted to strike a balance in between. So what I've done is I actually ended a job in a bank when I started. But for a while, I started, as I said, my business back from university. And so I had two things that I was working on. And it was extremely difficult to maintain both of them. When you talk to a lot of people, they're, they're going to say, I mean, how would you have two things all together? That is almost impossible. And my answer to that is actually, it is possible. But when you have a very harsh time policy, when you have a very harsh time policy, time management skills, you'll be able to really master your time. You'll be able to dedicate a time for your job where you can have a fixed, let's say, uh, paycheck, you know, and a set of responsibilities that you're comfortable with. And at the same time, you can explore other stuff, you know, and one of them is actually having a career outside of your paycheck, uh, outside of your paycheck job, basically. So there's a lot of ways to go through it. So let me just explore more here. And as I said, I mean, this is a one once in a lifetime journey. It might not be that the only the uh, opportunity, honestly, but it is extremely difficult to get that, ex that chance again. A lot of people, when they grow old and they have kids and they have other financial commitments, 
you know, let's imagine that you are now working and you've got to this level where you have a specific paycheck that you're extremely comfortable with. Let's say that you earn, for the sake of example, 3,000 BD in a month. And that is very, there's, this is a very difficult number to acquire if you're, you know, in the IT space. However, there's a lot of people who got to that level where they can, you know, earn 3K, let's say, per month. And so when you get to that sort of paycheck, you wouldn't really want to explore other stuff that can jeopardize your income. You know, you wouldn't really just focus on other stuff. And so what I'm asking you to think about here is that, you know, you get to have a chance at a crossroad where you can, you know, really build something really amazing in the very beginning, because it is honestly going to take a lot of time. But starting early is the key to having, you know, a wonderful career outside of the job world. And if you ask around, if you go to a lot of people, most people are going to tell you that they're not happy with their jobs. And the failure is, and the, I mean, the issue is not only with the job world, to be quite honest. Sometimes people have different directions of life. Sometimes people have different things that they want to do with life, different values, different priorities. And when you spend more than eight hours in your job, you know, you probably want to act as a family member. You want to treat them as a family. And if they have different values than yourself, you know, you're definitely going to have multiple clashes. <laughs> and so the idea is here to start early with whatever you want. And then as you watch it grow, you might as well, you know, uh, basically uh, resort to it when, th when something bad really happens at, at your job. And I always think about it in this fashion. People normally have this mindset of having a sing single, income, uh, single uh, income stream because it makes their life much easier to conquer. You know, they can focus on other stuff, being with their family, be, being with their friends and such. But the number one issue with, you know, that it, uh, having everything centralized at a single income stream is that when that income stream is gone, you're gonna be also in a very tough situation. And so think about it in, in different views. You can have your job as a paycheck that you can get on a daily basis or on a monthly basis, but on the same time, you can have that sort of light, you know, on the right side where you can chase if you have the time and the opportunity let's say down the road when you have a career shift or a career mi a mindset change. And that also can serve as a backup plan or as a backup income stream. And believe me when I tell you this, back in 2008, when the whole financial crisis happened in the world, even though it really started in 2008 in the US, but it has affected a lot of people here in Bahrain, the really smart ones are the ones who had things that they can hold on to away from their jobs. Because imagine all of a sudden somebody comes in, they say, you know what? we're going to fire you. It's not because you're bad. It's because the world is really going through a very tough spot now, going through a really difficult stage. And so we have to let you go. And that really happened to a lot of people. And the smart ones are actually the ones who had a different income stream on the side that they can hold on to, you know, and, uh, and they managed to survive for quite some time until they figured out how to go and move in for another job. So think about it from different angles. It's not just that you have Another thing that you're doing just for the sake of fun, you actually have another thread of, uh, let's say, safety. When something goes wrong, you can always re resort to it you know, as a backup plan. So think about it really, really well, because if you're a graduate, if you're having a career, let's say, change at this moment, this might be the best time to go and think about you know, starting a new business, no matter what you heard about how difficult it is. I mean, everything in life is really difficult, but to really spend hours of time doing something you enjoy and something that you get the full credit for is beyond amazing, in my humble opinion. Okay, so a <clears throat> few things that I want to share here. The first thing is, if you're starting in the IT space or if you're, you know, if you want to start a business in something, exploring is really important. So a lot of people get this notion that, you know, we should really know what we want to do in life in the very beginning, especially when we're talking about our careers. Okay, I graduated from university. I should now start in whatever that I enjoy or I should find a job and I should know what I want in life. Well, honestly, that doesn't happen. That at least happens in movies. In real life, you get to explore and exploration is extremely expensive. So that means you should do things that you might not enjoy. You might do things that can really change down the line. But exploration is really the key for you to understand what you want to do in life. And the way I go through it is, you know, as somebody that works in this field, and if you want to chase a career, let's say in computer science or computer engineering or programming or the IT world in general, 
the landscape is really huge. We're talking about full stack development. We're talking about front end development. We're talking about back end development. And that is only development that we did not cover the whole spectrum. But on the other end, you have cloud and you have stuff like game development, security, and a lot of crazy stuff happening out there, correct? And so the landscape is really huge. And you have to have that time where you get to really discover the full landscape. Otherwise, you won't be able to tell if you enjoy something, you know, rather than doing something else. So take your sweet time at the very beginning when you graduate or when you have this career shift mentality and go and explore. Just figure out if you really enjoy other stuff, you know, in life, other you know, than just development on, let's say, on mobile phones or something like that. So exploration is really important and it gets you that edge to figure out if you really enjoy doing things in life or, you know, just to understand how you prioritize stuff in your life. Okay, let me just explore some of the realities about business and jobs. Starting a business, I mean, spoiler alert, is definitely too darn difficult in case you did not know. So you have to cover things like, uh, okay, so here's the, 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 the twist. A lot of people, when they join a business or a company, they just figure out, they just focus on what they do. So if you're a programmer, you join a company, you work in a bank, for example, you just focus on, you just focus on creating you know, the, the software that they need at the end of the day. The twist is if you if you create your own business, you have to cover other stuff as well. You gotta do marketing on your own. You gotta manage the business on your own. You gotta do the finances on your own as well. And it might not be a, you know, a smooth journey, especially for a technical person. And you know, you're more focused on dealing with code other than dealing with humans and other numbers. So, you know, getting to that, it's, it's a steep curve for a lot of people, but it's truly fruitful because you get to really enjoy the whole thing. You get to see, I'm not going to say enjoy again. I'm just going to say you get to experience the whole spectrum, which is a very valuable experience. You get to work with people. And the problem that a lot of people don't understand is that even if you're good at what you do, it's not just enough. You have to cover other disciplines as well to make it out there. If you're thinking about financial independence, for example, you got to be the social aspect of you know relationships. And so, part of really doing a business is actually making the money itself. You know, making money is the essence of doing a business. You're not doing charity, and that means you also have to deal with people a lot of times. So, if you're not that Let's say if you're not that, uh, you know, people kind of Social. a person, exactly. If you're not that kind of a person, you're going to have to go and really, you know, make your skills much better because essentially, you know, what happens on uh, down the line is that you're going to have to talk to people. You're going to have to convince them that, hey, I've got a great product or I have a great service that might, that might benefit you. And you're not going to be able to really scale if you can, if you just work in the kitchen per se, you know, you work on your product and service, but there's nobody out there that can really benefit of it or can use it. So thinking about these core skills on the side is extremely important. And I figured out that a lot of people really figure, you know, how these, uh, how important these things are down the line when it's extremely late. So having that sort of a thing is important to do at an early stage. Now, what I'd recommend is trying to get as much as possible in terms of interviews. So even if you you hate a business job. I mean, you can just apply for it and just experience the whole interview experience. This is really wonderful. You get to see how people treat you, how you can present yourself, how you can ask the right questions. And it's a very, uh, you know, valuable experience. Even if you get embarrassed, don't really think about it that much because the embarrassment that you get, you know, that feeling of embarrassment that you get, that you go through is really the uh, stepping stones to making it, you know, uh, in, in this sort of world, you know, getting acquainted, you know, with these feelings and how to handle them, especially in the career world. And so starting business is not so easy, to be quite honest. So spoiler alert, as I said, it's not going to be very fluffy. It's not going to be very, you know, greenish on the other end. You know, you have to really be sure that you, you want to be in this, you know, sort of, uh, you know, journey. It's not for everyone, by the way. So I reiterate on the subject figure out what you want. It might not be for everyone. Okay, cool. All right. One more thing that I want to talk about, if you want to really stay, let's say, uh, if you want to stay long in the game, is that you want to make sure that you have a proper policy for handling pending payments. And that is extremely important if you want to survive in this business. 
A good example is, so if you do, let's say, sort of a job in Bahrain, well, let's take Bahrain for example, because this is where we are currently. If you work with somebody and you get a gig, all right, and you finish the gig, be it building a website, building an application, there's a huge chance that you're not going to get paid in the next month, you know, or the month after, which is very common in Bahrain, by the way. So I do a lot of stuff for government bodies, and sometimes it takes up to one year, one year and a half for me to receive my cash. Yeah. So think about it in this fashion. If your cash flow is, uh, is bad, you're not going to be able to survive. So it's very fine for me to have, let's say, multiple, you know, thousands of dinars, you know, and as account payable in somebody else's account, just waiting for, for them to, uh, to pay me. But it's, uh, that is not going to be very helpful if I need to pay the rent today, you know, if I need to eat today. So those things are extremely important to figure out early on. You have to have a strategy, you know, or multiple tactics to, to handle pending payments. That is to have follow-up sessions, uh, to really have a regular, let's say, legal, uh, uh, let's say legal uh, arrangements with those companies in order to make sure you get a down payment of some sort. So a good way to go through it, if you're interested, is to have a down payment early on with whoever you deal with so you can get the commitment of the client. When you ask clients to pay down payment, it shows that they're really interested and they're not playing around, which is one of the best strategies that you can really use in making business. So if you have somebody that is, let's say, very, I mean, somebody who's a bit hazy about the idea of paying a down payment, you can just expect it that it's not going to really, you know, last that long. So, you know, having that sort of mindset of how to handle your cash flow early on is really important, especially if you're a startup or a small business, because you know, you are, you might not be doing really, really, really good on finances. So just to make sure you stay afloat, you have to make sure you understand how the calendar, you know, how the schedule for payments uh, happen, you know, for you to survive. And if you want to start a business, it's, there's a huge distinction that you have to make super early on. Do you want to be a business guy or do you want to be a technical guy? And that really changes the game for a lot of people. Take, for example, programmers. When they start, programmers, I mean, by, by nature, want to focus on what matters to them, which is code, applications, cloud, machine learning, whatever it is that it's really interesting for them, they want to focus on. However, there are elements that are, are extreme importance if we're talking about business. In this case, the business aspects, like marketing, as I said, accounting, business development, you know, doing that CEO work, basically. And, and so if you don't have those core skills, you're not going to make it. Now, one way of handling that situation is to pair up with somebody else who knows how they're doing this sort of things. And so I've seen in my career, technical people dealing with other business people as partners, you know, doing that sort of thing. So they're distributing the work equally. So you as a business person can at least focus on lending new gigs, lending new jobs, uh, making sure that, you know, uh, customers are lined up correctly. They have you know, a good amount of expectations for the kind of work that you're doing. And at the same time, you want to have a technical guy focus on the real tech, or well, let's say the kitchen itself. And so those two people are basically the building blocks of having a good business at the very beginning. If you don't have a lot of manpower, a lot of finances to hire people, you have to cover those two roles. You have to have somebody who's wearing a business hat and somebody who's really, really competent when it comes to the technical aspects of your business especially if we're talking about a technical business, such as building applications or so building something on the cloud or machine learning or whatever it is that we're talking about here. Now, sometimes people can really get to that stage where they can wear both hats. It's very rare, but a lot of people can do that. And one of them is Elon Musk. No, love him or hate him. <laughs> Elon Musk is really good when it comes to the technical aspects and the business aspects. In case you did not know, he actually started as a game developer in the very beginning. And then he made his way into building financial products like uh, X.com, which is now PayPal, you know, the, the one thing that we use and love every day. And so Elon Musk is a great testament to how, can, to how you can really build up experience from the ground up as a technical person and then pick up those business aspects down the line. And this is actually the route that I've taken myself. So I am a technical person. I started as in a hardcore developer who enjoys doing games, who enjoys doing low level stuff. I, I remember my flame religious wars over C, C++, and VB.net and all of these things, you know, when I sit with my friends 
And now I got to this stage where I discuss business and you know how to get gigs and opportunities. So these people are the people that we call unicorns and they're very difficult to come by, just like Pokemons basically. And so if you come across them, make sure you hold on to them. They're really good. And so you could be that kind of a person. You can be somebody who's really good in the technical aspects and can also really focus on you know, the business itself uh, if you're really good. But that requires a lot of time, requires a lot of experience. But I really urge you to get to that level in case your business line is extremely difficult. So you don't want to go as a business person <clears throat> into a meeting where you try to persuade one of the customers to get your product or service, and you don't really know the technical aspects, or at least you know the surface of your technical, technical details of your product and service. That is not going to sound really good. Again, even if you're a business person, you can leave the really nitty gritty details to your technical folks or your technical partner when you have that sort of thing. One thing that I forgot to mention is that when you, that, when you do that sort of a job, when you figure out that, hey, I'm now in a state where I have to find a partner, it's exactly the same when you're trying to get married, by the way. And this is a very old joke, but having a partner is even more difficult than finding a life partner or a wife or a spouse or whatever it is that we're talking about here. Because there are so many things that have to sync up in order for you guys to stay together in this business relationship. You have to have the same values. You have to be hard workers. And you have to be very understanding to each other's, uh, let's say, habits and, and that sort of a thing. And so if you just work with somebody just because they're available, you might really burn yourself down the road. And this is why you hear a lot of people just tearing down businesses, just like, you know, getting divorced in, business, in, in personal relationships, because that happens all the time. People have different values. People have different things that they want to do in life. So it is very likely that people are going to break up down the line, business-wise or even, let's say, from an individual point of view. And so when you're at that stage where you're looking for a partner, make sure that you really look super good because you don't want to be paired up with somebody who doesn't respect you from a business perspective, one who doesn't understand your line of work, who doesn't have the same values. And this happens all the time, by the way. If you look into history, a lot of great partners, you know, break up after a while because sometimes, you know, an individual in the relationship wants to do different things. They want to deal, let's say, with the government. Some people want to deal with different companies who are, for example, manufacturing weapons or something like, like that. And so, Make sure you're really aligned from a you know, mental point of view before you get to that stage. And so finding a partner is not an easy job, to put it simply like that, and just to be extremely frank about it. But it is really well worth it when you have a partner that you can really work with, because they're going to be taking part of the workload. They're going to be doing their aspects of the job. You can just delegate the technicality to them if you're a business person, and you can just deal with the business aspect and keep everything simple and cool you know, for yourself, just focused on the business. So yeah, this is something to put on mind. Now, one thing that I also want to mention here, when you start, you know, when you think about making, um, you know, products or services or something that is useful to other people, you will normally have two things that you can offer. And I've already laid them down here. You can either work with services or you can either work with products. And each of those have, have uh, each of those has their own benefits and you know negative points as well. So a lot of people normally start with services because services are extremely fast to get by. So I can just say, you know what, I'm available to you know develop applications. I'm available to doing websites and such things like that. And I'm up and running. I can start the business the second I just declare that. And that is awesome because you can start really fast. The downside to that is that you have to sometimes scrutinize the customers that you're gonna be dealing with. Not every customer is clean. Not every customer is gonna pay on time. Not every customer even understands what they want. And this is an extreme difficult problem. So I've dealt with customers where, you know, I dedicate time for my own. And then it, eventually I figure out that they, they never had any, let's say intent to really put this business up. So they're just doing it for the fun of it. So you're wasting hours doing meetings, sketching details, doing a lot of stuff, and eventually they're not really scarce. Now, on the other side, some services are really well worth it financially, which means, yeah, in Bahrain, for example, there's a huge tendency that you can find customers that are willing to pay 20K BHD or 30K BHD for a certain service if you get to that level where you're extremely comfortable with the line of work that you do. So it is well worth it down the line for specific lines of work. 
or for specific customers. And I always say services don't scale, which means you have to dedicate your time in order to accomplish services. Now that is, um, I mean, the counterpart to, act to that is actually products. Now with products, you build things and it's just a matter of selling them. You're definitely gonna do a bit of few, uh, let's say social work in order to get them around, but dealing with products is much easier when we compare them to services. You get to do much less work with products because you've already had the thing, you know, you already have the thing. It's just a matter of selling it, getting sales and business development people to actually just go ahead and sell it to other people who need it. And that is even better for targeting your right customers because customers who want your product are gonna reach out to you, which means they've already done the work of looking forward to get that sort of you know product to begin with before reaching out to you. And products scale much better, which means if you have a good product, it's very okay to have a business that is only uh, if, if it only consists of three or four people, but you can do a lot of sales and that can really cover the expenses at the end of the day. And products can make it much better for you because you can just focus on one thing in one thing only and customers can just scale and get what you want. So there's a bit of debate in here whether you should go for services and products. It's up to you how you want to do it. It might be faster to start with services, but down the line, you're going to see a lot of professionals pivot to doing products because it's much easier for them to scale, okay? And remember, the IT space is extremely big. You know, you can't just put your fingers on everything now because everything is really big. You have cloud. And when we're talking about cloud, we have things like Amazon Web Services. We have things like GCP, cloud, Google Cloud Platform. We've got open banking. We've got APIs. And we've got, you know, machine learning and development for games. And look, you can go crazy. You can just go on and on and on about the fields that you have now lining up under this huge IT umbrella. So there's a lot to cover. So sometimes it's really good to be picky about what you do. So maybe in the very beginning, as I said, I really endorse the idea of exploration, but down the line, you might want to give yourself a deadline of some sort so you can start getting really good in one thing or probably to, you know, max in order to stand among your peers, you know, when it comes to that specific aspect. So you might be extremely good when it comes to building APIs. And down the line, people are going to say, oh, when we're talking about APIs, we know that an individual who's really good at that. So a specialization in one of, is one of the things that Google normally advocates for. Because, you know, you do one thing and do it really, really good. And this is, you know, the mantra that a lot of people pick up and endorse when they go over it. So I, I'm not really a big, a big fan of uh, sounding like a cold store that, hey, I do everything in IT. Whenever you have something, just give me a call. I'm going to do it for you. You need a website. You need to build that, you need to design, you know, I'm going to do it for you. This doesn't work. And that is not really good for your brand as well. So as I said, exploration is good, but after a while, you want to really focus on a couple of things after the work that you've done in the exploration, because that is supposed to give you a lot of exposure on what you like and what you really hate. And remember, you get what you pay for. And that means in the business, there's a huge chance that a lot of people are gonna somehow challenge you when it comes to your financial choices or your cost. So, <laughs> you know, in a business like applications or website development or, you know, cloud, a lot of people are gonna say to you that, you know what, why should I go with you if there's already an abundance of people out there that are willing to do my line of work? You know, if, if you are looking to build a website, there's a dozen people out there who can do the same thing. But here's the thing, when you specify a price, you know, you get to have, you, you basically, you get what you pay for. And so that means, um, sorry, this, this actually can be looked at from two different angles, but when you wanna get a service, when you wanna do subcontracting, sometimes you have to pay really a specific amount if you're gonna get the job done. And that means sometimes you have to really look for what really um, matters to you in terms of quality. Sometimes you have to pay even for your tools. And, you know, if you wanna work, in a professional fashion, you can just go around and look for pirated tools and such. Sometimes you have to really pay for you know, what you want to get that thing. And that drags me to the other aspect, which is the other angle, just like what I said, which is pricing. So pricing is key to survival, which means sometimes you have to lay down your prices early on when you want to start that, hey, I'm going to do that for that specific amount. And I can do that for that specific amount. You can start with a humble amount, you know, in order to grab people in the very beginning, because it's a sort of a mutual relationship. 
you're trying to, you know, uh, you're trying to make money by doing work. And they're also trying to give you the, the gig because you're, I wouldn't say that cheap, but you're affordable in a way. And so because you want to get more experience, you can charge less so you can get more opportunities. But that is really important because as you become better and better in your business, just remember that you want to make sure that you don't take your prices down. And this is a very big issue and a big mistake that a lot of people start doing when they get into the business. They say, you know what? I'm going to charge you, let's say, X amount of money when I do the service with that product. And under a lot of pressure you know, and challenge, uh, basically challenging, you can say, you know what? I'm just going to discount it a lot just for you. So when you do that, it really hurts your brand down line because people are not going to respect you know, that you have fixed pricing for different things. Yes, you, you can go and you can be very flexible when you handle that, you know, take it with a grain of salt. But however, you should not treat it as the standard go-to solution of just, okay, I'm going to lower it as much as possible until I get the gift. This doesn't work. This is actually bad for you down the line. So specifying is fixed pricing is really important for you to survive and maintain it so people can understand that you're doing this. You know, so the word can be also can also be spread and people understand your pricing models as well. And one of the important things that people also forget about is going official. So when you start a business, you can just, you know, play around and do things as a freelancer. Nobody's going to really judge you, but there's a huge chance that you're going to run into a legal issue down the line. You know, you could have, let's say, a dispute with one of the customers. And this happens all the time, by the way. And so you don't want to be in that stage where, you don't, where, where you're not backed, let's say, by law. And I've seen it with my owners multiple times. So the best way to go about it is for you to be official from the ground, from the get-go, which means acquire a CR, a commercial register, early on when you can. And now when behind, for example, you can get the individual CR license, which means you can pay a very, like, a very small amount from the beginning, but you can start a development house you know, with your physical address back at the house, which is a viable solution. But you can get a bank account, you can legal, you know, you can get legal uh, price as well. And that's really fruitful because if you're going to deal with customers, they're not going to send you the money on your personal account. This is a big mistake that a lot of people think that they can just get away with. If you're starting with a small gig, imagine you're building a website, let's say for 50 or 100 BD, which is already bad. I mean, <laughs> by default with that uh, small amount, but these people are not going to say no to you when they, when they want to give you the cash uh, in terms of, so when they want to give you the, the money in terms of cash or even sending it to you over benefit pay or something like that. But when you get bigger things, like imagine you're receiving 10K, 10K PhD or 15 or 20K PhD from Kuwait or from Dubai or one of those countries that are surrounding us, do you think that they're going to come in person and get you a bag of money or they're just going to send you, you know, the cash onto your personal account? This doesn't happen. So having an official entity is extremely important if you want to sound a professional from the get-go. And also, if you're not happy with your business line, you can always pivot. Pivot as in change direction a bit until you figure out what you want to do. But never over pivot. Otherwise, you're going to be just, you know, circling around, wasting your time. And this is, I mean, this is an important aspect to understand really well. I'm not saying do not explore other stuff, but what I'm trying to say you know, after you spend your time exploring a lot of stuff, make sure you have a vision to at least have a direction to go after. Not just, you know, you know, every single year you chase something different. I mean, that is going to be very bad for your brand as well, because people are not going to be able to know how to associate you going forward. Should we say Muhammad is an artificial intelligence guy or Muhammad is a, let's say, a game developer or Muhammad, for example, is a good professional when it comes to building websites, your brand is going to be lost. So over pivoting, sometimes it's just too much. And no matter what you hear from the people out there, how they're having the time of their life, you know, with their entrepreneurship skills and their entrepreneurship journeys, most of them are actually suffering. And this is really important to understand from the get-go because it's not going to be easy. I know people who used to pay themselves 100 BD, even though they used to have families, you know, when they started their businesses. And I know people who did not pay themselves for probably three months, you know, because they started something early. So really setting your expectations right from the get-go is something that is really going to help you even mentally going forward. Because if you have, you know, um, 
let's say a uh, falsified reality that you made for yourself, you're going to be um, in a very different, different, difficult spot. You're not going to really handle reality well when things go crazy, especially in the entrepreneurship, uh, you know, journey in general, because the curve is in a way exponential. You start very slow in a way, and then you grow super fast if you stay long in the game and if you do a good job. So think about that. Every time you hear about, about when you, every time you hear people say, hey, I'm enjoying my company. I just started, I'm making money. Not all of it is really true. Yeah, just think about it from that uh, you know point. Of view. That's a lot of people are trying to sugarcoat what they're doing because it makes them sleep at the end of the day. <laughs> but you setting everything, you know, setting the expectations right early on can really help you sleep well better than that. And yeah, just enjoy the journey because you know it's all about doing what you want to do. And remember, I mean, doing what you love, as uh, cheesy as it sounds, is really what matters in, in the end of the day. You know, life is very short. Every single day, and I'm not trying to be dark here, but <laughs> every day you got people, you know, um, uh, going to the next stage, uh, <laughs> people who are basically passing away, people who just leave this world for whatever reason, whether for the good or the bad reasons, but nonetheless, you know, your time on earth is really short. You might as well want to enjoy it. And that can mean doing the things that you love and then eventually having an income stream at that. Don't get carried away in doing things that you hate because eventually, as I said, just remember you're more of a battery in life. You have a time span, a limited time span, and you might as well do the things that really enjoy them that have, that have value for you and for other stuff as well, for other people. In my last two cents before I let you go and you know probably open up for questions is learn to say no. And saying no is extremely important. I can't stress on that enough. It's probably the number one skill that you wanna acquire when you start. You want to say no to people who want to have your time when you can't afford it. And you want to say no to people when they want to get you to do free things for them when they're not really, you know, uh, worthy of it, let's say. When it's not worthwhile for them to get those things for free, especially for businesses who label this as pro bono, meaning just do things for free for us and we're going to get you a marketing boost, for example. Sometimes that doesn't work and it's more of an abuse, honestly. So really scrutinize and vet what you're getting. If you're doing things and can really aid you, let's say from a PR perspective or a branding perspective, yes, do it. But learn to say you know for businesses who want to abuse you, who want to get your time and experience for free. That doesn't work for you. It's not going to help you out. And um, learn to say you no know, to toxic people at work. If you're not happy about different people in your life, just cut them loose. And as difficult as, as it is to say it, but you have to do it. It's like divorcing people that you're not happy about. It's, I mean, it's very fair in life to go through multiple stages where you say, you know what, those people are not in line with my mentality. I'm trying to break, trying to make money. I'm trying to make, you know, a something, something that I'm proud of. And these people are full of negative thoughts. People are taking me down. I might as well just leave them all together. And I've done that multiple times in my life, to be quite honest. I left maybe three or four different groups that I can call my friends, you know, going growing up. And that is extremely important because being surrounded by good and positive people, I mean, I can't stress on it enough, but it's extremely crucial for you to survive. Even if you stay with your family and take that again with a grain of salt, if you're not happy about the kind of discussions you have with your family, if you think that they're taking you down, try to do what's necessary to be around them, but try to surround yourself with more positive people because this is the only way to grow and to really enjoy life before you, you know, go to the next stage. And uh, just remember, time is really precious. You know, it's okay to be picky and stand up, stand by your choices. Whether you're talking about your choices in work, whether you're talking about your choices in career, in a life partner, and time, doing favors and everything. Time is basically the one thing that you cannot take back. Everything in life can be taken back. I mean. You can pay somebody to fix some of the things that you've, you know, uh, missed out maybe. Uh, but you, you can pay some, uh, a person to do, let's say, to build your machine or to build a product or do something else. But to get to that stage, you know, to control time and do things differently is something that cannot honestly be uh, done. And so remember, time is probably more precious than money. Think about it in this way. And... The ultimate thing that I don't want to say to people because I'm more into the AI and machine learning space, remember that in the race of business, data can either make or break your business. Everything you do in life, every judgment you do, every decision that you do has to be based against data. 
You can't just say, you know what? I feel that my gut is saying like that. I mean, you can't take that as an answer. Always, you know, base your decision making against data, data that you can validate. And this is really, really important. Now, if you really enjoy my sessions, you can check out my YouTube channel. It's Amina Todger. You can just write Amina Todger in English or in Arabic. And I have more than 50 talks, I think, now on YouTube. And I have some of my talks on Google for Dubai. And I've uh, talked about open banking. And I have technical subjects like reverse engineering, if you're interested, or how to build games from ground up, how to build CPUs or microprocessors. So I can really go as technical as you guys want. But nonetheless, you know, you get to have this as a reference in case you're interested. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me in here. You can always reach out to me on aminatajer.com. Again, I'm very reachable. I can always, you know, answer questions, you know, on Twitter or Instagram. And uh, yeah, check out our work at infiniteware.com. And if you enjoyed this, just let me know. And I'm going to open up for questions now. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you so My much pleasure. for giving us your time. And if anybody has their questions, they can ask them. You can open up your mic if you feel to. Um, my question, could you please uh, summarize uh, the part about service? Uh, about service? Okay, just a sec. I just want to know who am I talking to again? Just for me. Uh, who am I talking to again? Me, Muhammad. <laughs> Muhammad, okay. So yeah, with services, the idea is you can look for people. I mean, you can look for gigs, let's say, or opportunities to accomplish. You can build a website. You can build an application, build, a, build something that your customers want. But that dictates that you have to sit with them, understand the requirements, understand what they want to do. And that can really go crazy because not every customer understands what they want to do. Not every customer is serious. Not every customer is good when it comes to translating what they want. Or uh, not every customer is willing to pay. And so there are multiple challenges spanning the service kind of mindset where you say, you know, I'm willing to do that service. Let me know of what you want to do. So for, for me personally, the best way to go about it is you building a product that you enjoy and you believe in. And then it's just a matter of scaling the sales. It's basically just, you know, doing more sales of that product because it's just a matter of basically selling it. You don't have to sell it on your own as well. You can hire people who are really good when it comes to sales. But the idea is you focus on one product and you really believe in it. And, and so when you have that focus, it becomes much easier for you to maintain your product and your work and your effort. You don't have to be scattered around multiple clients trying to satisfy everyone and everyone has their own requirements. Everyone has their own tech infrastructure and all of these details. A lot of people take that choice by building their own product you know, for a very long time and then sharing it with the world. Some people really, you know, just get a breakthrough and people get, you know, um, you know, multiple demands for that sort of, sort of product and other people just fail with their product. So they have to start over. So it's just about the way you reach out to customers and understand what they want as well. And by the way, I don't really believe in saying that the customer is always right. Sometimes the customer doesn't know what they want to do. And so you have to aid them in getting to that level. You know, a good example is the iPod, for example, or the iPad or the iPhone really great, let's say, breakthroughs in my humble opinion, even though I'm not a big fan of Apple, but that really shows you that sometimes you got to bring the change to the customer on your own. You got to see where they're going and you have to anticipate what they want to do. You should not really expect that it is 100%, you know, that you're going to get the customer to tell you what they want explicitly in the right way. And so, yeah, my two cents. Thank you. My pleasure. So Asan is asking, if you are searching for someone to join in your team, what are the main skills that you search for, technical skills and other? Um, normally, when we're talking about technical skills, it's important that you have somebody who has a good foundation um, for computer programming. That means understanding how performance works, how machines work, how protocols work. Because, I mean, you can get somebody with hands-on experience. And I see this, this I see this through, uh, trend a lot where people graduate with let's say practical skills more than the foundational you know aspects or stuff and then when they get to uh, a stage where they have to exercise their mentality exercise their let's say thought process they really suck because 
at that moment, they're just more of a hands-on, but without really understanding the foundation. So try to find somebody who has a good balance of both. Somebody who understands algorithms, for example, the technical details of how the computer works and everything, but has somebody who has the technical ability to translate what they want to do into a tangible thing. I mean, I, I have a lot of friends who can talk about algorithms all day, but when you ask them to program something, they will never know how to do it. And the other way around, I know people who can get you, uh, let's say an Android application in no time, but when you ask them to figure out how to do, to really translate that algorithm or build something from the ground that they wouldn't really know because they got used to just dealing with things like Lego parts, you know, just plug and play and you're good to go. So that doesn't really work. You need somebody who's practical, somebody who is really ex good when it comes to experimentation, somebody who's not really, uh, you need, by the way, somebody who's really good when it comes to communication. The big issue with technical people is that they think that you, you don't need to be good when it comes to, you know, basically uh, sh talking to other people and explaining to them what, the, what, what you want. And honestly, this is one of the more skills that you have to figure out. And that is how to communicate effectively with people, even from a technical aspect. You need to explain to people that this software doesn't work because of that and that and that or that service. Or you need to really shift or change your frequency depending on who you're talking to. If you're talking to a business person, you have to give them the jar jargon that they understand. If you're talking to a technical engineer, they probably want to talk about variables and algorithms and other stuff. So make sure you just tune it down for the people who uh, you know, want to talk to you. Anybody else? It's either that you guys really enjoyed it or I bored you to hell. No, I think it was really interesting. Um, I like my computer science isn't my major, so forgive me if my question sounds really dumb. So one way okay. it's like, um, I really don't know how to put it in words, but like, um, for when you create a video game, is it mm -hmm. necessary to have additional information? Like for example, Assassin's Creed. If you talk about mm -hmm. Assassin's Creed, like I was a few days back, I was really interested in history, so I. I came to know that Assassin's Creed was actually based on a group of assassins with, mm -hmm. who were actually called Hashashins. And oh yeah. And, and, the, and yeah, and they had this fight. I it wasn't it wasn't fight, but it was like their rivals who were Knight Templars, you know, the during the Crusades. So mm -hmm. it's all history. And they ended it in a video game. And I think Assassin's Creed is pretty famous, right? So is it yeah. important to have additional information like that to have a successful video game? production so so the game development discipline fatma is really huge there's a lot to it and uh, i have a series on google that um where i try to really navigate it from the ground up by understanding game development requirements how to build the right hardware for your games you know how consoles are made from the ground up and i'm going to share the link here in a bit but what i want to tell you it all depends on what you want to focus on so if you're let's say a storyteller you might not be interested in the technical details. You can just focus on the history, the storytelling, and you know those elements and everything. And you can have a programmer who's extremely interested in building the technology, not even the game, just the technology to allow game developers, fellow game developers, to work on their games. So this is also a valid way of doing things. Um, so other people would like to sometimes work on a game itself. They're called uh, level designers, they're called game designers. So the, the, there's a lot of disciplines basically, it depends on what you want. So the more you cover out of that spectrum, it helps you to integrate better with other people. So when I know, for example, how to explain my technical issue, if I'm a tester, I'm gonna have more respect from my fellow, let's say game engine engineers, because they will say, oh, this guy knows how to talk to us in our jargon. He can exactly tell us you know, where the issue is. But if you don't have the lingo, let's say the you know, the way you go forward, sometimes it will become extremely, you know, difficult for you to explain what you want. Um, but yeah, it's a very valid question. Uh, I'll show you, and I'm just going to give you my LinkedIn. Uh, you know, video games that are really interesting, they're like either you know, they're like based on horror films, like I think Resident Evil, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. like they always have some base, like a base that's not, uh, you know, specifically for games, but they're integrated into video games and they're much more interesting exactly exactly and, and i think what really uh you know captured my attention in the very beginning when i started my journey as a game developer is that it's a wonderful medium honestly 
I mean, you can watch movies, but you cannot interact with movies. And with games, now we're getting to that level where you can interact and watch at the same time. Games like Uncharted, games like Last of Us, they just capture your attention and it can take you, I mean, it can take you to like really, 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 really dimensions that are, you cannot get to on your own. You yeah. know, you can understand the story, you can build a narrative on your own. You can like, when you sleep, figure out, I mean, why did that guy really hit that guy? Did, did he have a motive? You know, did he get a motive in mind before he did that? So it's like getting into um, basically, you know, a universe, just like Marvel universe. There's a lot to it. You have a narrative, characters and such. And the technical aspects are really impressive. I mean, to be a game developer, you have to understand how linear algebra works. And this was my number one issue back in university. I remember I got taught linear algebra in the University of Bahrain, but I was saying, come on, I mean, for God's sake, just explain to me practical use case of that technology before you just shove it on my face. You can't just say, okay, learn vectors and learn matrices without giving me, I mean, you could have really easily sold me the, the idea when you tell me that, hey, you could be a game developer when you work with that, you know? You could have easily done that. But we were studying those things as just, you know, as abstract from, uh, concepts, which doesn't really, you know, add a lot of value. But would you connect the dots and tell people that, hey, this is a concept that might seem hard now, but you're definitely going to use it when you're focused on that thing. And it becomes much more lucrative and, you know, let's say attractive for other people. Linear algebra, for example, is, a, is an important skill if you're a game developer. Everything revolves around dimensions and speed and velocity and if you have a game. <laughs> But because exactly you know, I've, I've hated physics and maths but then you realize that if you really want to enjoy life you have to integrate these things into you know yes your life and so it all also depends on the way you get educated so when you're in the perfect place and you know you can experiment with those things and you can see them in action let's say in a game you can easily capture the attention of the students and this was again my beef with the educational system at least here you know it's all abstract concepts and sometimes you're not interested in abstract concepts you want to get your hands dirty you want to move things you want to do things before you and use you know what i'm going to read it more maybe this is going to sound useful down the road but yeah i mean uh, game development so cool okay, let me just give you i, I think mean, i think the best one is the virtual reality thing that just um, came out like it's going it's so famous like i think my favorite was the attack on titan virtual reality where you can like <laughs> you know, be your, your own character and interact with other people. That's, I found it really nice. Yes, yeah, really, exactly. Uh, so this is my, actually, uh, my series that I had on Google and it's still going on, by the way, but I have five episodes that I've done with them so far on Google uh, Middle East. And this is uh, a series of five episodes until now. And it starts by understanding how the hardware works, how everything, and we got to the stage where we now have a game engine up and running and we're working with it. So it might be interesting for you guys. Uh, yeah. Um, does anybody else have any questions? I have a question. Thank Go you so it. much for the amazing space. Uh, My pleasure. I have a question regarding, yeah, and you said that it's very important to explore and it's really helpful. But then you said, said that we should set a deadline for such exploration so it doesn't go crazy so yes. how much of a time exactly and you know, approximately should someone set a time for exploration yeah. okay think about it in this fashion uh, okay imagine you graduated 22 i mean if you're really smart you're going to start experimentation maybe at 21 or 20 you know because uh, university is really a great time for you to explore you know you only okay you study you have exams but i mean I mean, you work from the convenience of your house, you have the ability to interact with other people. You normally don't have that when we're talking about other stuff, like when having a job. And you know, if you get a job, sometimes you get only 20 days or 22 days per year where you can go outside, you know, as vacation. And so it might not be very open in terms of choices. And so experimenting with technology and such, like if I was in that position, then if you, know, if you wanna have a dual career, just like myself, having a job before, you know, uh, sorry, before creating my business from the ground up. I think five years time is, is good enough for you to at least figure out, you know, the direction that you should follow. Yeah, I, mean, I started as a, as a game developer. I stayed for a very long time as a game developer for more than 10 years. Uh, but at the same time, I was interested in operating systems and um, hardware design and such security. I did a lot of hacking, white hacking, black hacking. 
you know, just call it whatever you want. But I think, you know, being able to read, experiment, and, you know, you will change your values, but man, such a tough question to answer. <laughs> I wouldn't really know. I wouldn't really know, but I would say, you know, the sooner you get to know what you want, the better it is for you to, to build a brand. But it's very fine to have a brand in one thing. For example, in Infinite, where we do an artificial intelligence, but that does not mean that we're not experimenting with other stuff like game development. We do game development products for our customers as well. So the learning never ends, but the sooner you get something to hook up to or to, to hold on, you build a better brand. So people can associate you with that brand because that really, really matters down the line. Because you don't want to say, okay, Della, okay, what is Della really good at? I know that she builds websites, she builds games, but what is she really good at? I mean, that is a very tough question to get maybe, let's say, 10 years into your career. But to have that question, let's say, in the first year after you graduate, totally fine. So just think about where you want to associate yourself. Do you want to be, uh, I mean, after a while of experience, I think for me personally, five years is, is good enough. Four or five years is, is a sound amount of time where you can say, you know what, I think at least I have a glimpse of what I, what I want to do. And it's very right to change it going forward. Go for it, Naman. So uh, the question uh, is, what uh, courses or softwares should I learn for game development or what things should I focus more for game development? Okay, if you're interested in game development, what should you study? Um, it yes. depends on your, on your field. If you're into more more into designing, let's say art, drawing, doing 3D design and such, you can follow that track. There's a lot, tremendous amount of courses. And let me get you a, you know, LinkedIn Learning? You know? Just... No. Okay, so but, LinkedIn. But I'm more into the programming. I don't like the yeah. designing things like sketching or something like that. I'm more into like program, writing the program. Yeah, so you have Pluralsight.com, LinkedIn, these are paid services. And if you're a part of university, they're going to give you a really good rate. Um, you also have Udemy. There's tremendous amounts of, you know, tutorials on YouTube. But you have to stay focused. You have to really know what you want, you know, and try to make it better down the line. If you're hello, set, you know, that you want to do programming and you're interested in tech, check out the tutorials. And by the way, everything in the tech space revolves around experimentation and hands-on. You can't be good with math if you're just talking about math. You have to really experience it. And it's the same thing with programming and development and the technical skills. You can't just talk about programming and building games if you're really just talking about them or reading about them. You have to get hands-on experience. And that, you know, getting hands experience sort of a thing is the thing that will get you your edge in this space. Uh, thank you. My pleasure. Yeah, Unity is awesome. Yes. Um, Zainab is saying, do you suggest that a student should focus more on their studies in university? Hell no, big no. Uh, and, um, don't get me wrong, but what I'm trying to say here, okay, make the most of it. Make friends, get into experiences, build, uh, you know, okay, study, get better what you do. But remember, it's not about the academic thing only, the academic stuff only. The, the university aspect is just a full experience. You know, you should, and by the way, the best thing you can do going forward in business is to land deals with your fellow peers or your fellow students that were with you back in university. And a lot of people have, a lot of things happen like that. You, know, you build your client base, let's say 10 or 15 years from the people you've already met back in university. So don't really um, escape those things. It's extremely important to focus on building good social skills, uh, understand how people work, uh, believe it or not, group projects are really very useful. It can really tell you that some people are going to bail on you. Some people are going to be really good. They're going to be, you know, up to their word. And so I think it's more of a simulation of the real world. Think about it as a simulation of what can happen going forward and ma maximize the, the potential of it, not just uh, focus on the academic. By the way, whoever studies in university and misses out on the other stuff normally is going to work for one of those people who, you know, made their fortune by making friends and making so much, you know, uh, so many people out there. And this is the hard truth that a lot of people get slapped with down the line. All right. 
what do you think about games with JS? JavaScript is awesome. JavaScript is cool. Not my favorite language. I'm more, as I said, religiously in love with C++, but that is my choice. Um, but yeah. Anybody else? Are you guys happy? Did you guys get what you wanted from this session? You feel that you enjoyed you know, the delivery? Did you enjoy the content? Just for me to understand and you know, fix things here and there. Yeah, um, thank you so much for you know giving us your time once again. And I my pleasure. gain some knowledge because I found it very interesting, even though computer science isn't really my major. So awesome. I will, yeah, so I, I, I'll stop the recording right now. Is that okay? Definitely, yes. Yeah. And thank you so much, guys.